Well, good morning. morning. Dave, it's great having you in the front row, buddy. We're so glad to see you today. I put a vow of silence sticker on him, so, and wonderful job. Ernie, what did he, oh, he's holding it up. I'm like, why is everybody laughing on this side? We didn't even get to hear a bad joke today. I asked um, uh, Brian if he wanted to tell one. He said, no, I figured everyone, and this is what he said, I quote, everyone needed a respite, is what he said. Like, respite? When did we suddenly become sophisticated? Hello. We need a respite from the humor in this room. <laughs> so anyway, uh, now, now Michelle did tell me that you were a little bit hoarse, which I said was okay because you're also a Colts fan. So she actually told me that joke. She actually told me that joke. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about the practice of grace, which you will need for that joke. And so you may want to apply it. Um, listen, let me tell you something I know about people. How many of you feel tired frequently? <laughs> right? Okay. Maybe not now. This mor- Not this morning, because it's too exciting here. And you probably drank some coffee. Maybe you had a sugary donut. Woo! We ran out of donuts this morning. I don't know what's going on, because attendance wasn't that awesome, but people were like, sugar, do it. I guess after the fall festival. But uh, it's hair of, the, hair of the dog after eating all that sugar, they... If you know what that means, that's not good, so you need grace. So, so today we're talking about how I walk in God's grace, and this is a different kind of sermon. So typically, if you hear me speak, I'm going to do what I like to, it's an exegetical, I always do exegetical sermons. That basically means you, you take the scripture apart, you look at it, but there's two, two main types of sermons. There's a verse-by-verse sermon, um, and verse-by-verse people will tell you, that's the only way to teach God's Word is to go verse by verse. You've got to only do a verse by verse. Don't use the whole of Scripture. Uh, the problem with that is there are literally theological truths that we can only know when we do a topical study. For example, if you want to know about the Trinity, you can't just look in one chapter of the Bible. You have to actually look through the whole of Scripture. Now, we still don't fully understand this Trinity, but to understand about the Trinity, you have to look at different passages. Today, as we talk about this idea of walking in grace, we're going to look at some different passages, even an Old Testament passage to remind us this is not a new thing that we're learning to do. Now, let me tell you one of the reasons I think a lot of people are tired. They say that the average, you ready for this? The average phone user looks at their phone, you ready for this? It's going to freak you out just a little bit, over... 2,500 times a day. That's crazy. And for an active user, uh, it's 5,000, over 5,000 times a day. Now, I don't know who counted this, first of all, because I don't know about you. That's not a job I want, but maybe, maybe Microsoft counted it. But, uh, but the truth is, we're distracted. We are busy. And You and I can't find rest in God's grace unless we learn not to constantly be pulled away. Now, the truth is this. Even if you're a non-phone user, my guess is you have some distraction. You, You might already feel superior to other people who look at their phones. Those people that look at their phones all the time, I'm just angry all the time, you know, or whatever your, whatever your vice is, right? And, and the truth is, if we're not careful, we find something to be distracted and to look at. So let me ask you these questions, okay? Do you have peace? When's the last time you really felt at rest as you went through your day? When you pray, do you take time to sense God's presence or you just is it just an activity like check off your list, I prayed today? Or do you really take time to get still? I think sometimes if we're not careful, we make even prayer into an exercise where we're just trying to get through it, like we're trying to get to work, or we're trying to make it through the work day, or we're trying to get through our prayer time. It should never feel the same as any of those other things that I mentioned. If you aren't a Christian, or if you have a friend that's not a Christian, one of the things they're going to look at you about and pay attention to is, do you act any differently than they do? Is there something about you? See, the thing about early Christians, you know why early Christians were called Christians? Because to other people, they looked like Jesus. They acted like Christ. Therefore, they called them 
Christians. They weren't called Christians at first. They were called Christians when they said, you act a lot like Jesus. And they meant it as an insult, by the way, which is awesome. Like, you Christian. And you're like, thank you. Right? It's weird. And, and, but that's the truth. And so if a friend of yours isn't a Christian, or if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I would encourage you, are there people that you've gotten around and you said, you know, they've got a peace. They've got a presence. They, they've got grace in their life that I don't have. And, and what does that mean? Now, I don't know how you grew up, but this is a mini version, by the way. But I grew up pretty much on construction sites. My dad was a contractor. Uh, my mom, when I was very young, decided that she did not have enough degrees. So she actually went and got her uh, regular college degree and then her master's degree and then her specialist degree. She started going to school. I guess when my brother and I were born, she said, I've spent enough time at this house. And... Uh, so on our days off, whether it was a holiday or a teacher's work day or whatever, my mom was going to school or taking a class or going to the library or studying or writing a paper. And so my brother and I went to work with my dad. Now, my dad was a contractor that was not an office. I know today there are contractors who sit in an office all day and show up at the job site and point and then go back home. My dad was a contractor who laid block and uh, put the walls up in the building and put the roof on the house and put the trusses on and then all the things that went along with that, and his boys went to work with him. And so one of the earliest memories I have is to going to Ross Oil in Miami uh, with my dad where he was working, and he had had a dump truck of sand, by the way, some of the best sand boxes you could ever have, an entire dump truck of sand. Every once in a while, he would have one brought to our house and dumped in the backyard. I mean, we have some cool sand stories. So we would go, and I was very young. I was a little kid. I was playing with little cars at his job site, and I remember there was a train that went by this job site. My brother and I would go out. We were little bitty kids. We'd go out and put pennies on the track and wait for the train. We could have gotten so killed. But anyway, mom has no idea about these stories. But here's what happens when you grow up like that. My dad raised us like he was raised. And when my dad was raised, his value was based on how hard he worked or how not hard he worked. And my, that's how, what my grandfather did. It was always competition between the brothers. And for my brother and I, my brothers and I, it was the same way. If my brother, older brother worked harder than we did, he would come home and at the dinner table, he might say something like, well, your brother worked really hard today. You guys didn't really measure up. Or you guys didn't really do what he could do. The worst one I ever heard that I did not say live was when my dad, we were sitting at the table one night, and just my younger brother is a year younger than me, and I worked one day. I'll never forget my dad saying, Eric, you worked so hard today, that was great, and your brother can't work worth, you fill in the blank with that next word. And you would think, as a kid, I would think, oh, that's terrible, but all I thought was, oh, see, you work hard, and you get accepted. You work hard, and you're loved, and you're cared about, and you don't, and you're rejected. And that's what I learned, and so, when I first became a Christian and gave my life to Christ, I thought... That I had to earn my way to God. I had to do a bunch of stuff or he wasn't going to be happy with me. And he was in heaven just waiting for me to mess up and not work hard enough. And then he would reject me. So here's what I want you to know today. If you don't hear anything else, hear this sentence. What you do is not what makes you significant. Okay? It's whose you are. And if you're a Christian today and you surrendered your life to Christ, that means you are his and so even when you blow it and even when you mess up and even when you don't get it right, he still absolutely and completely loves you. And for those of you who don't know what that's like, I, I will tell it this way. My mother will say, hey, I thought I loved my children until I met my grandchildren. To which suddenly I feel really bad about my life. But, but I think so often when we look at our lives, if we're not careful, we... We think that God's in heaven going, you get this right, and then I'll love you. As I go through this message today, if you want to have rest, I want to encourage you. You have to learn to walk in God's grace, understanding that God accepts us. His power and His presence is with us, and we're significant because of His love. And because of His love, then we accomplish what He's called us to do. When we get it backwards... And we think that our works are going to save us or somehow make God happy with us. We blow it. It doesn't mean that works aren't part of the Christian life. But we're going to talk about how 
So often we get that backwards. We become a religion. By the way, the difference between Christianity and every other religion is, every other religion says you do these things and earn your way to God. Christianity says you surrender to God. He accepts you. And then you naturally want to do the things God's called you to do. It's a backwards way of living. So number one, recognize our acceptance by God. This is where so many people struggle. And I want you to listen to what Jesus said to these messed up, broken uh, uh, sometimes uh, um, crazy, uh, sons of thunder, um, deniers, people who thought, who's going to be first? Disciples. Here's what Jesus says to them. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Time out. So in, in Greek, in English, we use the word I love you like for all kinds of things. Like I'll look at Steve, love you, man. All right. And then I'll go home and I'll see baby Buster and I'll say, baby Buster, daddy's home, little puppy. And I love you, little Buster. I hope you had a good morning. I'm sorry you missed me. I know it seemed like forever I was gone. And, right? Or, man, I love tacos. Man, I love bacon. Man. I mean, some people start wars over bacon. I'm telling you, that's... The world would be a happier place with the more bacon. He says, as the Father has loved me, that is agape love. It is the, the highest form of love. In the Greek, there's different words. There's philio, which where we get Philadelphia. That's brotherly love, friendship love, like, love you, man. And even Peter, when Jesus said, do you love me? Peter kept kind of lowering the standard, like, yeah, okay, I kind of like you, okay. I mean, he kind of kept going. If you look in the original language, he lowered the bar every time. But Jesus doesn't say that. He said, I agape you. And then he continues. He says, as the Father loves me. So think about this. Jesus loves you as much as God loves Jesus. I mean, let that sink in for a minute. See, what we like to say is, but I don't deserve that, and... Then we miss the whole point. He continues, now remain in my love. And then he says this. This is where we also mess it up. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. And then some people go, okay, good. I'll get the list out and then I'll make him love me because that's how we grew up. And we're going to get to how you do this at the end of the message when we get to the vine and the branches. That's what the rest of this passage is. If you keep my commands, you remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. And so we start to say things, yeah, but, but what if I mess up? But Eric, you don't know what I thought this morning on the way here when that guy cut me off in traffic. Or, or even the little things. You know, that guy stopped at a green light. You should have thought what I thought, right? By the way, I just had a red ant on my neck. That was exciting. I felt it. Thanks, Daryl. Did you throw one at me? Is that what happened? Okay. Some of you look at your past and you think God can't love me because of what I did in the past. Listen to what it says in Romans 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement, anybody need that? Give you the same attitude and mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. Wait a second. What mind did Christ Jesus have towards us? Oh, he said, as God loves me, I love you. And then Paul says, hey, take that a step further. Love each other that way. Eric, I don't even like them. Don't you think Jesus some days was like, I mean, they're doing the Lord's Supper and the disciples get in a fight. Who's going to be first? You guys don't get it. Jesus washes their feet. He said, so that with one mind and one voice, who do we glorify? You glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So time out. I, I got to talk about this word for a minute because our world has misused the word acceptance. And they've changed the word acceptance to mean if you don't approve of any behavior, any sin, any way I feel, then you don't accept me. And that is not what this verse means. It doesn't mean to look at somebody and go, man, I think it was wonderful when you punched that person in the face. Now, we may have enemies that we think that about, like that was wonderful, yeah, if we're honest. But, but we all know that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And this is not talking about right and wrong. What's he talking about accepting? Remember, Jesus sat with the woman at the well. And he talks to her about all kinds of things and about her life. And she's messed up. 
before he leaves, after he's built a relationship with her, he says, go and sin no more. Oh, then Jesus didn't accept her. That's not what it says. Jesus accepted her, but knew that she needed to overcome sin. We all know somebody who has a sin habit that's ruining their life. And if you love that person, what do you want? You want them to overcome. Maybe they have an alcohol issue. You accept them as a person, but you're still looking at them going, listen, I'll help you any way I can, but I won't enable you. I accept you and love you, but you can't continue this behavior and hang around my family. Acceptance doesn't mean being a doormat, but it means that you can love people and God loves you like that. Can we recognize that? And the problem is, once again, you know, this morning when I was putting on my shirt, all of a sudden my thumb says, ow. And I went, oh, yeah, that's right. I was getting a pizza out of the oven and I had the little oven mitt and the oven mitt slid down just a little bit and I grabbed the, the, the pizza, the thing the pizza was on. <laughs> Immediately knew, ow, right? And so now when I was putting my shirt on this morning, I was doing the buttons, I went, ow, ow. Some of you, because people rejected you or hurt you or attacked you for something or told you you were not good enough, or you just felt not good enough, maybe it was a parent or a teacher or a job, and you weren't accepted, you think God's that way. So don't put the way somebody treated you in the line of where God treats you that way. Make sure you understand, even when you fail and you fall, He accepts you. Now listen, he loved the prodigal son. He did not go get him out of the pig slop. But he couldn't wait for him to come home. And sometimes we have to realize even when we fail and when we fall, he's just waiting for us to come home. Number two, rest in God's power and presence. Rest in God's power and presence. You, God, so David is in the desert. I don't know if you've ever been in a desert, but if you've seen Dune, you know what it's like. And if you haven't seen Dune yet, Go see it, but don't go see it like I did, where I went to the movie theater to see it. Three seconds into the movie, the movie stopped. The manager came out and said, you can go home now. We can't get it to work. It's a very short movie. So David's in the desert. Deserts are miserable. Deserts are hot. Deserts are places you can die, be attacked. All kind of bad things happen in the desert. And David says... You, God, are my God. And then he says, earnestly I seek you. When's the last time you earnestly sought God? You notice he doesn't say, I seek what you can do for me. Too often we're seeking God's hand instead of his face. This is David seeking his face. God, I just want to know you. He says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. You ever feel that way in this life? You go through a hard time, a struggle... A dry place. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. What's he doing? He's remembering the good times when he could sense God's presence. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. What's that? That's lining up your soul with your body. By the way, time out. I saw a video this week. A pastor I love. I think he's awesome. But, but he was judging Worship based on outward appearance. And I remember thinking, I think there's some verses about that. You know, like David. And maybe God judges the heart. So be careful not to look at somebody and go, oh, that person raised their hands. So they're more spiritual than that person. Or that person raised their hand. Boy, they're just full of emotion. It's, it's not our place. That's God's place to judge. So don't put yourself in the place of God. David said, I raise my hands. And then he says, I'll be fully satisfied with the richest food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. By the way, there's not the richest foods in the desert, so he's looking ahead, isn't he? And then he continues, on my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Night watches were when you needed a guard to let you know everything's okay still. Now, I don't know if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night. But most of the time when you wake up in the middle of the night, you're having reruns. Right? Remember when you did this? Boy, that was dumb. Remember when this happened to you? That was terrible. 
right? And you're playing all the movies you hate, all the reminders of the things you've been through. And David says, I wake up in the middle of the night. And what does he do? I think of you because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I love that. When you think of a, of a, of a mother protecting you, a mother, so they found, actually found birds, baby birds, after forest fires. And the baby birds were alive and the mama was dead. Because what did the mama do? Covered up the babies. Sometimes when you're going through a really hard time and the fire's hot and life's tough and you don't know what's next and all it seems like is there's no way out, God, I need to, I need to just sit in the shelter of your wings. I, I can't fix this. I can't make it happen. I can't do what's next. God, all I can do is worry about all the things I don't have, but instead I'm going to focus on what you can do for me. God, I'm going to eat the richest of foods. Um, Dave, you're in a desert. I don't, I don't know if you noticed. In the watches of the night, I'm going to worry about everything. No, I'm going to say, God, thank you for what you've done. And by the way, can I give you a little, little help? When you have that replay in the middle of the night of something you did, or something you went through, or a person that hurt you, or a situation that you hate, <laughs> this is what you need to say. God, thank you that you helped me walk through that. Or even, this is my, let me tell you what I say sometimes, God, even though I did that dumb thing, thanks you that you used me anyway. By the way, God can use donkeys. He does every Sunday here. You haven't heard that yet? It's one of my favorites. I cling to you. Are you clinging to God or to your works? Or the things you think you can do or your activity? Your right hand upholds me. See, if we're not careful, we let our childhood or something we went through or that rejection or when we felt left out, we let that interpret how we sense God's presence. I remember one of my earliest memories was when Disney first opened. My family drove to Disney World. I was, I don't know how old. Disney's at 50 years, so I was maybe three or four. And one of my first memories of Disney World is I was near the castle. And my family of five children and two parents, four children and two parents walked away. And I was by myself outside the castle. And I began to cry. Apparently it was loud enough that the security guard came over. I remember the hat and the badge. And I remember him bending over and asking me if I was okay. And I was not okay. I did not know where everybody went. So he went and found my family and brought me back to them. They had lost me. I told that story to my mother this last week. She said, well, I must have not been there. I just figured they were trying to lose one on purpose. It was getting too expensive there. But here's the thing. Sometimes any type of rejection, any type of feeling left out, any type of feeling abandoned, if we're not careful, we'll put that on God. And David says, I cling to you. God, when I'm feeling abandoned, when I'm feeling lonely, in the middle of the night, when the desert's dry, when it doesn't seem like there's any help, I'm under your wings, I hold on to you. This is a great psalm to read when you're going through a time and you don't know what to do. Because we've all felt alone. We've all felt rejected. Number three. Realize you're significant in his love. See, what you don't know about me is from a very young age, I was a performer. I was child four out of five. How many of you are middle children? Welcome to my world. Welcome to my world. We love you. Okay. How many of you are oldest children? I'm not sure I like you now, but it's okay. No, I'm just kidding. You can pray for my older brother, by the way. I won't say this anywhere else, but he has uh, bladder cancer. He's got to go to a cancer center. We got the news this week. It's not good news, so be praying for him. I, I didn't say that in the live service. My brother would have killed me. Um, so if you're a middle child, you kind of know this deal, right? You're at the dinner table. You need to be the loudest, probably. My sister remembers me standing on my chair at the dinner table and eating. It was survival, people. We were just trying to... But the other thing I remember, one of my earliest stories was my parents talking about, we went to the Passion Play somewhere across the state, and I, at about three years old, two or three years old, little bitty thing, barely could walk, going down and shaking everybody's hand. By the way, where were my parents again? But anyway, so I went down and shook everybody's hand, and they, they all said, oh, it's so cute. And then when I was in third grade, I was singing solos on the stage for church. 
Didn't work so well when I hit seventh grade. I had a solo with no accompaniment, and I hit puberty right before the solo. And instead of singing, Halo, blessed one, I sang, Halo, blessed one. Alfalfa sang better than me that day. It was bad. So bad that the music guy said, yeah, that was bad. Right? And here's the thing. When we learned to perform, people go, great job. And then I started playing drums, and I won the choral award and the jazz award at my school. And a cruise ship company came to me and wanted me to play drums on a cruise ship. And I was all about, hey, we're just going to perform, and that's going to be great. And I felt accepted when I was performing and felt rejected when I was not. And what I did without knowing it is even after I became a Christian, I thought God was the same way as people. And God was looking at me going, come on, perform. Come on, do it. If you don't perform, I don't accept you. I don't love you. I don't care. You're not significant except for what you do. Many of us know that feeling. Listen to this story. You may have never noticed this because this is so misused so often. Luke chapter 10, 17 to 20. The 72, so he sent out 72 disciples. You probably didn't know that part, right? Sent out 72. They returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And you got to admit, that's pretty cool. Like I went out and and I was, I would say something and demons would speak and run away. And I don't know, pigs went over cliffs. I don't know what happened, okay? So the demons listened to him. That's a big deal. So Jesus says, hey, that's great. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then he says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes, scorpions, overcome the power of the enemy. And then he says, nothing will harm you. By the way, people love to use this and say, I don't wear a seatbelt because I read that verse. And Jesus said, don't wear a seatbelt. And I say, that's wonderful. We're going to miss you. But anyway, so I would just, because I'm a jerk. Okay, so, so, right? Nothing will harm you, right? And so you think, okay, so what does Jesus say? Jesus says, that's great. I have given you power. I've given you authority. I see what God's doing. You're, you're, you're kingdom-minded. The enemy's fleeing. And then listen what he says. Listen to this. This is important. Don't miss this. However, by the way, when Jesus gives a however, you know what he's doing? <clears throat> McFly, right? However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but, but we just were. But we, that we just made that a big deal. Did you not hear us? I mean, you even said it was pretty cool. He says, don't rejoice over that. But then he, what does he say? But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What? You mean all this cool stuff we just did and the awesome things we've seen aren't that big of a deal? You know what's a bigger deal? That you're part of my family. God, I did all this stuff for you. We had a fall festival last night. We had 58 people from our church help. We had hundreds and hundreds of people from the community come. God, I saw, and you can almost hear Jesus going, that's awesome. I saw uh, uh, the enemy running, and I see God doing great things in these people's lives, and I see your church really reaching out to people, and I think that's wonderful, but you should even be more excited that you're part of his family for eternity. Because here's what happens if we become focused on doing and performance. We become works-based. But Eric, we just did a bunch of works. Wasn't that great? Yes. But the why and the how is bigger. Because here's what happens. Let me read about the cycle of works, which is the opposite of the cycle of grace. I begin try, by trying to achieve impressive accomplishments, accomplishments through my own strength, for my own ego. I hope that by doing this, I might feel significant. So what happens? They can look exactly the same. But the motivation is, God, I'm going to do this stuff and maybe you'll be happy. I didn't say this last service, but... Some of the last words from the guys who flew into the Twin Towers were, I hope that Allah will be happy with this. Because they thought they were earning their way into heaven. When we try to earn our way into heaven, this is what it sounds like. I'm the only one that serves around here. And by the way, worship doesn't just happen at church. I'm the only one that washes dishes around here. I'm the only one that fill in the blank whether it's at work or somewhere else. If it's really an act of worship, 
God, I'm doing this because your love is in me and it's going to naturally flow out from me. Your attitude's going to be different. When you start to feel aggravated and irritated, how dare I have to do, other people aren't as spiritual as I am. Instead of going, God, thank you that I'm part of your family and I get to serve. Instead, we say, everybody should be like me. By the way, whenever you think everybody should be like you, you really are messed up. Dennis is like, I don't want anybody to be like me, right? Okay, so, right? But we've all done it. We've all done it. We've all done it. I think my glasses change color a little bit on this stage. That's how bright it is. That's funny. Okay, sorry. I heard what you said finally. It took me like a week. <laughs> Number four. Listen, so I don't want you to think obedience is not a big deal. But it's how we're obedient that it's a big deal. We reap fruit while we're abiding in Christ. See, the opposite is I'm going to work and make God love me. When what it should be is, I'm, let, I'm, let, me, let me explain it easier. I didn't bring one because I broke it. Do you know what a hurricane lamp is? You pour the oil in, it's got the wick. You crank it up real high as a kid and it starts to smoke everywhere, right? You put it down and just, right? And now they tell you you're not supposed to burn those in your house because it kills brain cells. And I realize I've killed a lot of brain cells because we were kids. We burned that thing all the time, played with it. We probably put oils in it that you're not supposed to put in it. We might have had Crisco. I don't know. Whatever. Right. But when it starts to run out, the flame will start to go out. Right. Because it's actually not burning the wick. What's it burning? The oil. But, you know, you can make the wick burn. Did you know that? You take a lighter. No, don't do that. Okay. When your mom's not looking, you take a lighter with no oil and you can burn the wick and burn the wick up. As Christians, you're the wick. He's the oil. And yes, you can work yourself to death and boy, you'll look spiritual and you'll make a lot of smoke. And you'll be exhausted. And you'll say things like, I just want some peace in my life. I just need to take a break. Now, there's times, don't get me wrong, there's times that we need to take a break. Jesus actually went and rested. He actually told the disciples one time, let's get away from here. It's indirect quote, but that's basically what he said. But so often, if we're honest, the reason is not because we're doing too much, it's because we're doing it with the wrong power. So what's the right power? Well, Jesus explains it, John 15. The same verses that talk about keeping his commands, what do they say? I'm the vine. You are the branches. If a man, excuse me, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You just smoke. And then he continues. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. You ever feel that way? I am burned out. We actually use that term. Isn't that amazing? It's almost like Jesus knew what he was talking about. If you remain in me, and then he continues, and my words remain in you. Where are we going to get his words? From the Bible. Spending time in God's word. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. Oh, that means I can pray whatever I want. If you abide in Christ. Because when you abide in Christ, what happens? Your desires... When you read God's word, you allow his word, you, your prayers line up with God's word. So my prayers are so honest, sometimes I'm like, God, you know, this is what I want. I'm selfish, but I would love it if you'd want what I want. God, I want my friend to be healed and not have cancer anymore. I'd love you to do what I want, but your will be done. Even Jesus had to pray, God, I don't want to go to the cross, indirect quote, but not my will, but your will be done. This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And then listen to what it says next. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. So you don't put on plastic fruit and say, look, I'm a Christian. I'm doing a bunch of things. What do you do? You abide in Christ and the fruit comes naturally. I've got an orange tree at my house. It's getting old enough now. I didn't have to go to it and go, oranges, 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 oranges. It's an orange tree. So guess what it's going to have? Oranges. Except it's a tangelo tree, so it's actually going to have tangelos. But okay. You get the idea, right? I didn't have to tell it to do that. Here's the deal. Too many of us are trying to go and get fruit and say, look, I'm a good Christian. Hey, abide in him. You're accepted by him if you're a Christian. You are loved. 
He cares about you. It's whose you are, not what you do. You're not significant because of your job, because of your position, even because you're a grandparent. You're significant because of whose you are. So the question today is, are you his? Have you ever given your life to Christ? The first step to receiving his love and receiving his acceptance and to abide in Christ is to understand that you are a sinner. You are messed up. You are broken. By the way, I haven't had to convince anybody of that. I've never had anybody that I said, well, one time, I will say that. In 30 years, one guy. I said, are you a sinner? I only had one guy go, nope. <laughs> what I wanted to say was, well, you're arrogant, so there you go, but I didn't. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I meant to keep that one in. But, but everybody knows they're broken. Everybody knows they're messed up, if they're honest. So the truth is, God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm messed up. I know I'm broken. I know that Jesus came and died on a cross and rose again. Why? To pay for my sins. I couldn't pay for them myself. I can't earn my way. So what do I do? I surrender myself to you. Lord, I choose to follow you and not to follow myself the rest of my life. And I surrender my will to your will. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender to you. That's what it means to be a Christian. If you want to talk more about what it means to be a Christian, I'd love to talk to you after the service. Maybe you become a Christian, but you've never taken that next step of faith through baptism. You can do that. I'd love to talk to you after the service. Maybe here today you're a Christian. And the truth is, as I talked about acceptance, you realize you struggle with all those things. You know what that makes you? Human. So just be honest with God about it. His acceptance is not based on your works. He loves you right where you are. So I hope you'll receive that. And because you receive that, then the fruit becomes natural. As you live in his word. Let's pray. If you have an offering, you can give it on the way out today. We're going to close in prayer here. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you that you accept us and love us right where we are. But Father, you love us too much to leave us where we are. You, you deal with sin in our lives. You deal with disobedience in our lives. But Father, even while we were sinners, you died for us because you love us. Father, I pray if there's anyone in here who's never surrendered their life to you, that today would be the day. And Lord, I pray for that Christian who's struggling with really receiving and abiding in you, that today would be the day they receive your acceptance, your love. We thank you for these moments together. Help us to walk in your peace and in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.